I okay, thank you, Bobby. And I now call this meeting of the library trustees to order. And I'll read the um, electronic. <coughs> Wait a minute, let me get my papers all straight here. Okay, first thing. To conduct this meeting wholly electronically and to effectuate both the emergency procedures authorized by FOIA and the emergency ordinance, this library board of trustees needs to make certain findings and determinations for the record. First, because each member of this library board of trustees is participating in this meeting from a separate location, you must verify that a quorum of members is participating and that each member's voice is clear, audible, and in an appropriate volume for all of the other members. Accordingly, I'm going to conduct a roll call and ask each library board member participating in this meeting to state your name and the location from which you are participating. I ask that each of you pay close attention to ensure that you hear each of your colleagues. Following this roll call, we will vote to establish that every member can hear every other member. So, Keith Fox. Hi, this is Keith Fox uh, representing Lee District. I'm sitting in my car in Washington, D.C. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Sheila Janiga is out for personal reasons tonight. Uh, Jane Miscavige. Hello, Jane Miscavige, at-large trustee, uh, calling in from my home in Vienna. Okay, um, Mason District, uh, myself, um, calling it uh, on video from my home in Mason District. Uh, Braddock. <clears throat> Braddock District Trustee, I'm calling from my home in Burke, Virginia. In West Virginia? Burke, Virginia. Oh, Burke. <laughs> I heard West right. Virginia too. Did you really? No, no. And I, and I realize that I've done this before, like halfway through, I switched from calling your name to calling your district. So I'm going to correct myself and go back to Sue Park. Hi, this is Sue representing Providence District, and I'm calling in from home. Thank you. Suzanne Levy. I'm Suzanne Levy, Fairfax City, and I'm calling from my home in Fairfax City. Sue Jatha Hampton. I am Sue Jatha Hampton. I'm calling in from my home in Great Falls, Virginia, and Drains District. Gary Russell. Uh, Gary Russell calling from my home in Mount Vernon. Priscilla Dando. Priscilla Dando representing Fairfax County Public Schools calling from my home in Woodbridge. Liz Walker. Uh, Liz Walker representing the Sully District and I'm calling from my home in Centerville. Phil Rosenthal. Phil Rosenthal, Springfield District calling from my office in Alexandria, Virginia. Thank you. At this point, I will pass the virtual gavel to the vice chair so that I may be heard to make the requisite motion. So Brian, you're it. I move that each member's voice may be adequately heard by each other member of this library board of trustees. So I have a second on that motion. Suzanne, uh, any discussion? All in favor <laughs> say aye. 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 Um, second, as approved. Second, having established that each member's voice may be heard by every other member, we must next establish the nature of the emergency that compels these emergency procedures. The fact that we are meeting electronically, what type of electronic communication is being used and how we have arranged for public access to this meeting. Therefore, I move that the state of emergency caused by the COVID-19 pandemic makes it unsafe for this board to physically assemble and unsafe for the public to physically attend any such meeting. And that as such, FOIA's usual procedures, which require the physical assembly of this board and the physical presence of the public cannot be implemented safely or practically. I further move that this board may conduct this meeting electronically through a dedicated Zoom meeting and that the public may access this meeting from the library website. I have a second on that motion. Second. Suzanne again, any discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Any opposed? No, okay. It passes. Thank you. Finally, is next required that all of the matters addressed in on today's agenda must address the emergency itself are necessary for continuity in Fairfax County government and or are statutorily required or necessary to continue operations and the discharge of this board's lawful purposes, duties, and responsibilities. Okay. We will so move. 
I don't think we have to vote on that. That's the end of it, isn't it? Is there That's another... it. That's it. No. That's okay. what I have. Okay, good. You have the gavel back. So now, yes, thank you. I now have, I don't have my gavel. Fran? <laughs> Fran? That, yes? Going forward is, are we, we're not going to be approving the minutes um, by uh Well, first I have to do the correct? public. Liz, first I have to do the public comment. Oh, okay, sorry. That's okay. Okay. Um, the library board wishes to provide an opportunity for the public to comment on library related issues. It is our policy to hear a maximum of 10 speakers at each regularly scheduled board meeting. Speakers are limited to one public comment during a six month period. Each speaker has a maximum of three minutes for their comments. A 30 second warning will be given before each speaker's time is up and the speaker will be expected to end promptly when time is called. Speakers are requested to pre-register with the library director. However, if there are available public comment slots open at the time of a board meeting, the remaining slots may be filled by individuals registering at the meeting. The trustees appreciate the effort required to speak to the board, but board members will listen and not question or respond to speakers. Tonight, there are no registered speakers, right? right. If anyone wishes to speak at a future meeting, please call the director's assistant at 703-324-8324. Okay, and now for the minutes. Um, are there any corrections to the minutes as printed or as read in your email? If there are further correction, a motion may be made, seconded, and discussed at this time. No? If there are none or were submitted earlier and made, then I'm, I'm just gonna say there being no corrections or no further corrections to the minutes, the minutes stand approved as printed, okay? That's the new thing. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Yay, okay, good. And we're moving on to the chair's report. <laughs> All right, that's me. So I'm going to add one thing about the budget presentation last night. Um, and Phil, thank you for being there. And Mary Jo was there. Mary Jo Patterson was there for the um, foundation. And I want to thank the following people. Um, because when I wrote up my presentation, a lot of people helped me. Um, Aaron for the great statistics and the write-ups in the annual report. Jessica for the, her great write-up and help at a moment's notice when I had questions. And Gary for the great ebook info from his report because my presentation mainly focused on ebook prices and why we needed money um, in our collection budget. And Bobby for getting Mary Jo and me registered as numbers 16 and 17 when the total number of speakers turned out to be 74. So they were a couple, they were an hour or so late at any rate. So instead of being, I think we, I think we were being gonna be around five or so, but instead we were like, we were finished around seven, but then they had 50 more to go. So <laughs> thank you all the people who helped with that. <laughs> and uh, the next thing is, um, uh, Jessica's going to share her screen for the National Library Week proclamation that was made by the chair, right? Um, not exactly. No. So, okay. What a, um, something. <laughs> the chair is not well right now. So instead, what I have is your actual proclamation. Oh, okay. Not a video. Um, and I'll read it off to you all and I'll send you the text of it afterwards. So this was signed by Chair McKay on April 3rd and it is your National Library Week proclamation. There was a plan to have a video as well from uh, his office and that did not exactly end up happening. But it says, whereas libraries are accessible and inclusive places that foster a sense of connection and build communities by linking people to technology and access to broadband internet, computers and training that are critical for accessing education and employment opportunities. And whereas in times of crisis, libraries and library professionals play an invaluable role in supporting their communities in person and virtually, and strive to develop and maintain programs and collections that are as diverse as the populations they serve. And whereas libraries have long served as trusted and treasured institutions for all members of the community, regardless of race, ethnicity, creed, ability, sexual orientation, gender identity, or socioeconomic status, and whereas libraries are cornerstones of democracy, promoting the free exchange of information and ideas for all. Now, therefore, let it be resolved that the Fairfax County Board of Supervisors 
on behalf of all residents of Fairfax County, hereby proclaims April 3rd through 9th, 2022 as Library Week in Fairfax County and urges all residents to take advantage of the wonderful resources available at their library. They actually printed two of these on accident. Mm -hmm. So we have one for library administration, but if anyone wants your own copy, Fran, we have a copy for you. <laughs> so that is your National Library Week proclamation. And uh, hopefully as we get back on track with in-person stuff with the board of supervisors, we'll be able to do that with them again as a, a presentation at one of their future board meetings next year. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Yes, and for those of you who, are, uh, who haven't, you know, who came on the board post pandemic, you know, we would be at the meeting and then stand and have the big photograph taken with the board and they made a big deal about it. So we'll hope for that sometime in the future. That's all right. Okay, the next thing I have is um, the nominating committee uh, appointment. And I, I hope everyone had a chance to read my email, um, sort of outlining the process just really briefly. Um, at any rate, I would like to thank Sujatha Hampton and Suzanne Levy for agreeing to serve as the nominating committee. So um, <laughs> I was gonna say something flip like, so if your phone rings, don't answer it, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> okay, sorry. <laughs> all right. Um, anybody have any um, any questions at all or anything they want to ask about that? We're all good. Okay, excellent. Uh, and now we're on to committee reports, and I believe the first one is Jane uh, Miscavige for the Outreach Committee. Yes, we had, um, I believe, the world's fastest outreach committee meeting on record today. Um, thanks for everyone for being flexible and um, sneaking a meeting in before tonight's board meeting. Um, really, the, the guts of our meeting consisted of Jessica's review of the um, spring talking points. And Jessica, did you want to just share those on your screen really quickly? Absolutely. Um, I, we don't need to talk this through during the board meeting, but for those of you who were not at the committee meeting, because most of us are on this committee, I just wanted you to see kind of the headlines. Um, Jessica, if you do you want to just hit like the big? Yeah, sure. So um, as you can see, we've got three main talking points for this season. The first is a more extensive launch of Canopy. Uh, I know that you all are aware that we soft launched that in February and in March we started some of our light rollout of it, but now that we know that it's working properly, we're really kind of pushing forward with this one to ensure that this grant period is one with some really sustainable data that we're going to be able to get out of it. So there's a nice chunk of information here for you all to share with your elected officials and, and your friends and colleagues about the service. You can get up to five free play credits a month through the library system. Uh, the next, even though it, it feels just like we've started spring, we're just starting to wrap up planning for our summer reading adventure, which starts on June 10th. Uh, we have programs for four different age ranges, preschool, uh, school age children, teens, and adults. So we strongly encourage all trustees to participate. There are some wonderful prizes, as you can see in these talking points, which will be emailed out to you after tonight's meeting. And then the biggest area is um, about our continuation of the year of literacy, as specifically for the month of May, where we are focusing on environmental literacy. Like with all the month, we have months, we have some events that are on online, some that are virtual, and some that are in person, and they're at both branches and system supported, so there's some links in the talking points that talk about those. But we've got some really wonderful additional things going on in the month of May that we wanted to share. The headline event is All Miss Coffee and Chocolate the Most, How About You? And how uh, climate change is affecting food production and production of kind of necessary items in our life over, over time. We also are participating in the 2022 City Nature Challenge, which is encouraging people, many children, but uh, adults as well, to get outside and participate in nature as things are starting to bloom. And hopefully the pollen counts not too high and makes everyone sneeze when they go out there. And the biggest piece that we're excited to share is the last one on here. We're tentatively planned to launch our newest library of things, ephemeral non-traditional collection in May, which are our conserve kits. Uh, similar to how in the past we had partnered with Energy Action Fairfax to do things like LED light bulb distribution and the rollout of our thermal camera circulation, 
This year, we're planning on the conserve kits, which are a bundle of both uh, disposable one-time use items and kind of evergreen items that people can take home and check the efficiency of both household items and spaces like uh, temperature guns, similar to the thermal camera, moisture readers in case you've got worried about water in your drywall or your walls, as well as things like socket gaskets. So you can plug up um, leaky like light switches and plugs and things like that. Uh, it's going to be pretty, pretty awesome. And we don't have all the marketing materials yet, but we are hoping for a, a May launch and you all will get those as soon as we have them handy. So those are the main talking points for this quarter. That's awesome. Thank you. So if anyone has questions about any of this stuff, please zip an email to Jessica or Aaron. And um, Jessica slash Aaron, I don't know, you sent these talking points to, I believe, the outreach committee members. Could you send them to the full board? Um, it's great for all of us to be able to forward these on. Um, and we will have one more meeting in June. So stay tuned for the rustling of the calendar. And um, we'll see you then, outreach members. Thanks. Thank you, Jane. Um, the next committee report um, is Evok Abbasi. Gary, if you have a report. Uh, yes, uh, we met uh, on March 31st and approved the um, overview that you can find in your packet, uh, which I hope you'll have an opportunity to read, uh, done by Jessica and her crew, and was designed primarily for us. But uh, there are also working uh, on a one page or a more informal uh, document that we can hand out uh, if, if we need to at some time. Uh, the state of play uh, of the issue is pretty much the same as it was when this was written, uh, but I, I thought I'd uh, try to quickly uh, outline it for the uh, board members that weren't at the committee meeting. Um, as you remember, Maryland passed a law last year which uh, required publishers to sell the libraries and to do so at a reasonable price. Uh, it was uh, signed into law on June 1st and went into effect on January 1st of this year. The uh, publishers promptly uh, went to the federal courts to try to block it. And uh, they were successful in getting a preliminary injunction, which uh, um, enjoined the state from enforcing the law. Uh, it's um, probably pretty certain that that injunction will become uh, permanent. It, and it also uh, seems uh, fairly certain that it won't be appealed. If it were, the uh, Maryland Library Association would have to pay the expenses uh, and it'd be very, very unlikely that it would be successful in any event. Uh, so in the meantime, though, there are eight other states who have been working on similar legislation including New York, which you may recall, we talked about earlier, they actually passed a similar bill, but the governor vetoed it uh, based on uh, the, the belief that it violated the copyright law. And this was the basis for the lawsuit. Uh, so uh, the, the governor seems to have been on pretty uh, solid ground and so if they are going to pass additional laws, there, there have to be some modifications. And it looks like the modification would be somewhere along the line of making it voluntary. That way you're not interfering with the copyright law because you're not forcing anyone to do anything. The question, of course, right away is, well, what good would it be if it were voluntary? They could do it now. Well, there are two answers to that question. One, the folks in Maryland believe that just the passing of that law induced Amazon uh, 
and, and Audible to start working with some of the libraries over in, in Maryland. Uh, so, so hopefully th that would be uh, uh, follow, follow suit in other states. The second reason, and uh, I think probably the most important one is it, it seems pretty certain that the next step to get a really uh, definitive action is to go to Congress and get either an exception to the copyright law for, for uh, libraries or to uh, modify the right of first uh, sale doctrine, which would let libraries do with e-materials the, the same thing that we can do with books. Uh, there may be a, a, another approach and, and uh, I understand that the uh, ALA is going to hold a meeting with shareholders at some point to to try to determine what uh, what what that course will be. Um, it, as far as we're concerned, uh, we probably will have to wait to see what that course is before we really go out front. But it, it's expected that. Uh, it, it would still be prudent for us next year to uh, ex explore again going to the legislature in Virginia to try to get a law passed, but for the reasons that I explained uh, earlier. So I, I, I think that's where we are now, uh, Fran. Any um, comments or questions for Gary or any one else? on the committee? Yeah, Phil. At the uh, meeting uh, today earlier, uh, Gary, I had mentioned I had talked to Senator Marston about a bill and he had talked to the Attorney General and because of the lawsuit, they didn't want to do anything. So it, he's, he told me this week that if you know, the lawsuit is resolved and there isn't a lawsuit pending, that he would consider helping us with introducing legislation. I could find others beside him, but uh, he said that he would consider doing that for us. When, when you say the lawsuit settled, even if it were settled adversely, just the fact that it's well, settled, I, he's, he'd be I, willing I, to go. I asked, the, the answer he gave me because um, he and I had a, a discussion was, um, you know, I had asked him before this and then basically his answer was they had talked to the Attorney General and the Attorney General advised him not to do this until the lawsuit was settled. So I don't have the answer to the fact that the lawsuit was settled, but not in our favor, <laughs> okay? So possibly between now and then, we could get better wording, like you say, and then go to them and try to come up with better wording. What I said at the meeting we had today, if in every state of the union, the Library Association got their states to introduce some kind of bill addressing this issue, and now the, the, the uh, publishers have to deal with 50 issues in 50 states and hire lobbyists in 50 states, at some point, my thought would be they'd come to the table and try to work out something with the powers to be. That, that was what I would like think would happen. The problem is, as you know better than I do, you know, nothing much happens in Washington. I think we brought it to Washington. I'm not sure who we're talking to, but you know, why people don't have an interest in this, that you know, every congressman and senator has libraries in their district, and every one of them knows what great work their libraries did during the virus and the pandemic, you know, why wouldn't they support something like this? But you know what happens in Washington, so. What doesn't happen to me? Anybody else? Okay, great. Um, next is strategic planning with Brian Engler. Okay, we, uh, strategic planning committee uh, last met on uh, March 28th. We had a great discussion. Uh, Doug Miller, who shares, shares the staff uh, strategic planning committee, which is much larger than ours, of course, I had quite a few um, 
suggestions and recommendations that they brought forward on various pieces of our strategic plan. And uh, we had great discussion on all of them. Uh, he will be taking our issues and our thoughts and suggestions back with him to the staff committee. Uh, they'll go through them, flesh them out, and bring some more recommendations to us at our next meeting, which is on Thursday, May 26th, uh, 3.30 p.m. Right now, it's planned to be a Zoom meeting as long as we can do that. So that's it. Anyone have any questions or comments for? Okay, great. Thank you, Brian. We'll move on to the school report for Syl. Good evening, everybody. Um, I was asked to share this particular week because we um, have been in FCPS celebrating School Library Month. Uh, National Library Week, of course, was the first week in April, and in FCPS, that was our spring break. So we um, were instead recognized by the school board on March 24. And inspired by Jessica, ours was a recognition that's pretty short, but I would like to read it because I think it um, sets the scene for, for additional information I have to share. So this was read by school board member, Laura Jane Cohen. National Library Week is April 3rd through 9th and April is School Library Month a time to celebrate our dedicated school librarians and their programs. The greatest assets to school library programs are the librarians themselves. Librarians teach inquiry skills that encourage students to ask questions, explore and evaluate information and demonstrate their learning. School librarians help students grow as critical thinkers, skillful researchers and enthusiastic readers. Most importantly, they provide an environment for students to be themselves pursue their interests and know that they belong. And following her reading of the recognition, um, she shared, I felt really inspiring and impactful personal um, experiences with her own child and, and the school library and, and what, it, what it means to her own child to be able to have a place where um, acceptance isn't a question and where um, student reading choice is paramount. And, um, uh, you know, the school board meetings are recorded. And, if, you know, if you have an interest, I'm happy to share the link with the timestamp because I found it very moving um, what she had to share. And then, of course, we um, there was a video that was also included in the presentation. And we're gonna show the video in just a minute here. But also uh, as, as happens in school board meetings, there is citizen participation, just like in our board meetings. And um, I was just really blown away by the many positive speakers that stood up, um, students and colleagues in the classroom, librarians, association leaders, just across the board, the positive comments and supportive comments, not only for what the library and what the library program does, but the expertise of the librarian, the trust that the li school librarian has with students and the instructional leadership that school librarians provide to all educators in, in their school buildings and beyond. So um, in the um, audience, there was a lot of support as well, including our very own Fran who um, attended and in, 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 you know, bore witness to the evening. And uh, in fact, there was an, an organized rally uh, to greet librarians as they were coming into the building that had more than 70 um, participants and uh, they gave all, all of the librarians who were there flowers, which I just, it was just lovely, amazing. Um, so before I show the video, I did want to share just a little bit of information. When we think about recognizing school librarians and what that means, you school librarians play so many different roles, but in my view, it's the only, it's the most important role is being the only instructional person who teaches every student in the building, um, regardless of skill or ability, regardless of uh, grade level or content focus, the school librarian works with every student and as such is poised to really be a change agent in a school, 
I say the culture of the library can help move the culture of the school. And um, as instructional experts and then also professional librarians, it's just a wonderful combination of skills because not only do we support students in their academic success, but we support them and inspire them and give them the space to be creative and to speak out and to explore their interests that help them be better citizens or at least work towards the goals that they have for themselves as individuals, not just the academics. Um, although of course, school librarians are instrumental in supporting students um, with their success in that area as well. And I, I would be remiss if I didn't mention the extraordinary efforts school librarians have been taking under pandemic conditions um, you know, Phil just mentioned how important this, the public library has been in, in this time of crisis. And it's the same for school librarians, not only doing their jobs in new ways, but also going above and beyond. Um, you know, I mentioned before, we're having a, a dire substitute crisis. Um, this week, all central office folks have been subbing in schools because of there's not enough substitutes. And um, librarians on a daily basis at their school are having to do their jobs as well as cover for their classroom colleagues. And it's a real strain and stress, but they care about students and they're there for the students. And um, I, I couldn't be prouder of them. So having said that, we have a two minute video um, where you will see a little bit a uh, snapshot of uh, some, uh, I don't know, a, a profile of three different libraries in elementary, middle, and high school library. Um, I hope that you enjoy it. And if you have any questions after, I am very happy to entertain them. So I'm going to very smoothly now share my screen and hopefully you all can hear the video. And the only thing that is missing is the ability to see the play button. Here we go. I actually went to Fairfax County Public Schools. And when I was in elementary school, I never thought the library would be the place that I would end up in. My librarian was a shusher. And like I said, I'm probably the loudest person in this building. I'd say the newest generation of librarians are really trying to pull in more of this socio-emotional learning that's going on. It's really changing what people think libraries are. I like to say that in this job, I get to be Miss Frizzle, that I get to encourage kids to take chances make mistakes get messy in here and it's a place where every single kid is welcome like in the mornings a lot of people come in here and hang out and just have like a nice like quiet place to either like work on homework or they need to get done before class or just talk to their friend and like it's really open to everyone i like the way we can pick our own topics i can pick something about sports something that happened in the news i can pick whatever i want here in virginia we have a school law that says you have to have a certified school librarian so i'm actually trained to help kids learn how to navigate information not just pull books off of a shelf but really truly learn how to go through a piece learn how to take a look at bias be able to cross-reference things and be able to say hey here's a skill i learned how to be this critical and creative thinker and apply it in multiple places in my life what i love about being a librarian is i get to help kids find the love of reading if they haven't found it yet and i get to help kids develop their love of reading reading can spark creativity and like imagination i get a better understanding of the world as it is and not just like the environment that i'm in so here in my library, I have a little over 15,000 books. And I know across Fairfax County Public Schools, we have over 4 million books. And one of the things that's so exciting to me about those statistics and those numbers is it really speaks to how much Fairfax County values libraries. Libraries are the heart of the school community. We really see students grow. We see them grow as readers. We see them grow as students. We see they're changing friendships. And we really do love that we are at the heart of the school. So I did not prepare. <laughs> I did not 
prepare any uh, little fact sheet for you this evening. Uh, I think the video speaks more than anything I can write up. If there's any comment or question, anything I can clarify or anything you're interested in, I'm more than happy um, to answer. Well, well, I know one, one thing that I loved about it when I saw it um, was that, you know, having gone to library school and got, had a master's in library science and I didn't take any of the school librarian track except I did take children's literature. Um, but thinking about the difference between, you know, the, the kids are there every day and in the public library, we maybe we see them every, maybe once a week or every three weeks when the books are due. So it's a real, a really different um, environment, and yet uh, it's it's not completely different. But I thought that was just such an inspiring, um, really beautifully well done uh, video. It was great. Thank you, Fran. I think one of the pieces that is important to us is the the ability to build relationships with students mm -hmm. that are lasting, that aren't tied to grades. That's huge. Yeah. Yeah. We're one of the few um, people that um, help students with their success and their interests. Um, and, um, you know, we're, we're, we have a different kind of relationship mm -hmm. than a classroom teacher does or even a school counselor does. Um, and that's, that's why I think being a school librarian is absolutely the best job in a school. Um, and we have a curriculum that we teach. Our curriculum is skills-based, so it works with every content area. But um, we also have just as much importance on connecting with students as individuals. And that is a core value of school librarians. And we're in a position to be able to follow through with that. And that's that's just something else that I'm, I'm super proud of. And, and I have to say in Fairfax County Public Schools, the FCPS leadership, um, my colleagues in curriculum and instruction, we are very, very lucky because we do have the support and the recognition in the school system of the importance of the school library program and um, particularly students access to information, protecting students choices for information and reading it that's, um, you know, very important to all of our librarians and we've received um, support in the system. That's great. And I think helping strengthen that partnership between school and public right now is really important with all the threats um, that are coming your way. Um, and I, I just sort of feel like we are probably not that far behind, you know, so it's good to be aware of all of that too. Okay, thank you. Anybody else have any? I think that was a very nice video. I, I appreciated that. Wasn't that great, yeah. Yeah, I, I love the, uh, including the comments from the students mm -hmm. and the fact that the, the messaging from the, the librarians, as well as the students and what we saw visually, it seemed like the library environment that I grew up in, which was, you know, shh, uh, yeah. quiet. There, I was engaged because I wanted to be engaged, but the new environment, it's so interactive. It's so much fun. It's like, you know, it's a place you want to go for a, a pleasurable experience. And I, th I just like that whole, the whole messaging from all the, uh, the, the, the video. Thank you for that. Yeah, good, good point. Okay, I think we're ready to move on to the director's report now. Jessica. Thank you, Fran. Well, I'd like to start off and say that I am incredibly jealous of Priscilla's video and I will be stealing all of her methodologies. <laughs> I can see that Erin is logged on and I hope she prepares herself for next year because that was amazing. It's such I'm a concise, facilitate that. clear way to show the impact that you have with your users and your colleagues and with the, the people that have impact on your library system. And then I am incredibly grateful for the collaboration and partnership between both Priscilla and myself and for our public and our school libraries. Libraries of all facets in Fairfax County are valuable and valued. And I think that this year's National Library Week and School Library Month have really shown that. So yay, libraries. We'll just start off with that. Okay. Yay. Um, okay, I have just a couple of things in the director's report. The, the first is a little update on how the new read and feed program is going. 
In prior years, you've known it as Food for Fines because we don't have fines anymore. The name has transitioned to a staff selected and voted on read and feed. Um, I will say it has not been going as donation full as in prior years. So we, we're really hoping for a slightly higher volume at this point, but it appears that paying off some of your fines really was an impetus for some people to come and donate <laughs> food items, not just people doing it out of the goodness of their hearts. So we're working on that and we expect we'll still have some really great figures and some wonderful quality and um, quantity of food to share with our partners at Food for Others, but maybe not the, you know, seven, eight, nine tons of food that we've had in years past. So still okay, looking good. And for those trustees who <clears throat> are able to participate in our Fall for the Book event, which is coming up uh, pretty quickly, just around the corner next week, we will have an opportunity, if you'd like, to bring a couple of cans or boxes of food to do a photo opportunity there so that you all can, can buddy up and show some of the stuff that you're gifting back to the system. I will be sending you a follow-up email on that tomorrow. Um, the next item on there, I am very sorry that we're not in person, so I can't introduce you to our new organizational development manager. I believe many of you knew our prior OD manager, Danielle Hobson. Uh, Danielle was an amazing part of our library family, and she uh, moved out to the West Coast this past fall. And <clears throat> I'm very sorry, Brian, but we stole the Kings Park branch manager, Valerie Drummond, uh, for this position. She is also an amazing professional. She, is, she was a school library media technician before she moved into public library work. And she's a trained mediator. She's involved in the county's employee advisory commission, as well as our Fairfax Public Library Employee Association. And she is just an incredibly positive, um, kind of fresh personality to have in that position. So I'm, I'm very much looking forward to how she is going to enliven some of our staff trainings. And she is already kicking us off and gearing us up for this year's 2022 in-person all staff day. So we're, we're looking forward to that. And then I had been asked to share a little bit about how some of the public budget hearings were going. You heard from Fran earlier that um, she was on the, the, the teen end of the 74 public speakers yesterday. They have public hearings uh, today and tomorrow as well. They both started at three o'clock and I believe they had pretty, pretty decent rosters of folks for both of those days as well. The, um, the hearings were just the last part of it. There were also all of the local uh, jurisdictional town hall budget meetings that your board of supervisor members were holding, which I also heard were pretty well attended virtually because most of them ended up being uh, of a virtual nature. And many of the commentary that I heard through the pub public budget hearing yesterday and that I would anticipate they're going to hear today and tomorrow are about the tax rates and the, the impact upon our residents as they are looking at both a proposed potential tax flat tax rate and the increased valuation on their homes and vehicles. So many of our elected officials have already said that they are dedicated to decreasing the tax rate. Um, so they've got the budget hearings yesterday, today, and tomorrow. They have a pre-budget markup meeting on the 22nd. And then they have a full budget markup meeting on Tuesday, the 26th. The 26th is when they actually make a decision on what the tax rate will be. They held a public hearing earlier this month and they have a, a cap on how much it can be, which is the current 1.14 on $100 of assessed value, but they can, they can make it lower than that. So they'll make that decision on April 26th, as well as any other considerations that they would like to roll in from these public budget hearings. And then in May, they'll actually um, adopt a budget to start in July. So it's definitely been a lot more public feedback and information coming out than in the last two public uh, rounds of budgeting um, during the pandemic when there was less change to valuations and no changes to the tax rate. So we will we'll see how this keeps going, but uh, so far pretty busy, lots of public feedback. And that's all I have to share, Fran. So, okay, thank you. Anybody have any questions or comments? No? Okay, we'll move on to the consideration oh, item. Suzanne, oh, Suzanne has her hand up. Oh, I'm sorry, Suzanne. Mute. Okay. I just wonder, do all the branches, when you put food into the boxes, speak back to you? <laughs> no. 
Well, I was very surprised when I dropped some things off at Fairfax this week that I was spoken to. Yes. So we have, as part of our initiative to ensure that all of our branches are having some fun with this uh -huh. and really participating fully, mm -hmm. uh, we have ponied up a prize. So the branch that brings in the most volume of donations and the branch that has the most creative display to entice people to make donations, I'm personally paying uh, for a pizza party for their oh, next branch wow. staff meeting. Mm. And some of the branches have gotten incredibly creative. If you go to, I think Chantilly, they've got it with a, um, it's not a trademarked character, but if it was close to a trademarked character, it's the one who really likes cookies and he's kind of large and blue. Uh -huh. Yeah, so he is there to accept your donations. And actually, Suzanne, your friends at the Fairfax branch asked if they could make a life-sized cutout of me that you could, that would have an unhinged jaw that you could put food into. And I said, that sounds lovely, but I am judging the competition for the most creative one. And I would choose that one. So I ended up not allowing that to happen, but they have really gone for it. And some of our branches have amazing artistic, creative folks on display. So please do use this as an opportunity to visit many of our local branches and see what amazing, wonderful, kooky things that they've got going on, some of which apparently talk to you. Yes, I was surprised. And if anybody's <laughs> coming to Laura's retirement party tomorrow night, you can bring some food for our boxes at Fairfax. What is and, it? And uh, Aaron, Aaron just texted me and said that photos of the displays are going to be up on Facebook starting Saturday morning if you want to take a peek. Cool. So Suzanne, what does it say? Are is that a secret? I'm, I'm, I was so taken aback. I'm not really sure. I have to bring some more food tomorrow. I think it was something thank you, but you know, I wasn't expecting to be spoken to. That's amazing. Yeah, that's funny. Mm -hmm. okay. I'll check tomorrow. All right. So now we'll move on to the consideration item. And um, we haven't done this in a while, but I believe I read this. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. And then... Um, so I will read this and then we we don't discuss it or anything. At this yeah, time. you just read the background. We will, but we will next month. Okay, so this is uh, for the naming of a meeting room at Woodrow Wilson Library for Carmen Fernandez. And um, library administration is recommending naming the meeting room at the Woodrow Wilson Library in recognition of the recognition of the late Carmen Fernandez. And the background on that is Mrs. Carmen Fernandez passed away on September 17, 2021. She was an integral part of the Colmore community, which is served by the Woodrow Wilson Library. Many of the program she, programs she supported through HACAN, Hispanics Against Child Abuse and Neglect, were held in the Woodrow Wilson Library's main meeting room. She made an indelible mark on the community through her personal commitment and dedication to supporting children and families. Costs for signage and an eventual ceremony are estimated to be less than $1,000 and will be covered by the library. So um, that we will, we will discuss that and vote on that at our next meeting. Okay, um, and the round table and I guess I, this is a good, I will, I have an, I do have an announcement to make um, that- I asked a question. Oh, I'm sorry. At some point, Jessica had this, uh, you know, the, in our packet, we had the things about the, uh, the people that you know ask questions or something about different types of books and so i thought we were there was going to be some brief report addressing that particular issue it, it, it's not it's in the in the information we got but there's no discussion on it so I'm not sure, was it to be a new business item, perhaps? And well, the, the answer is, I don't know what it is, other than it's in my packet, and there's, you know, several pages. Oh, that was from the meeting. Addressing uh, the process, so I thought there would be was some, some discussion, in other words, or, or some presentation, other than just what's, you know, everything else we have in here, we seem to go over and discuss. Not that I have any issue with anything, I just... So Phil, right. if I could answer I, that, that's part that's part of the minutes, and that was the presentation at last month's meeting. And you might have missed it because I think you were virtual. 
and um and, and maybe I, some of I, it, I, um, I apologize that's okay me. that's all right i'm glad we can clear that up so that that's what that is um and i guess um if you wanted any more information you could you know ask for a new business item for discussion at, at, the, at another meeting and just yeah, add anything to that no 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 um phil if you weren't able to um if you would like a refresher on the, the presentation from last month, I'd be happy to, to go over again. Okay, thank you. Yeah, of course. Okay, great. So um, I am sad to announce that um, Sheila Janiga um, for family and personal reasons is has already resigned um, from her position on the board and spoken to her supervisor about appointing, appointing a successor. So um, that's, that's my news for the round table. And so um, I guess I should get the list to be fair about calling on people because it's hard to do that in a virtual environment otherwise. So um, Phil, do you have anything for the round table? No, no, I think that I'd just like to thank Fran for the testimony that she gave last night. You know, I think she brought the point not that technically the board will do much in other words about it, but I. I thought it was a nice presentation and she did a very good job representing us as library trustees. Well, thank you, Phil. And I was thinking that I would send that, I could send the text of that to everybody. So um, you'll see what, what I did. Okay. Um, Liz, do you have anything? You're muted. I do have something. Okay. This is this is a first of all. I'm very sad to hear about Sheila not uh, being able to continue uh, supporting us as a trustee. Uh, but I'd like to follow up on the generous offer that Phil Rosenthal made last month in reference to the foundation mm -hmm. and um, matching any contributions that uh, anybody on the board is willing and able to make to the foundation. Um, he has agreed that anybody on the board, if you've made a, a, a contribution to the foundation since the beginning of January, it will be counted towards this effort. I've talked to the foundation. They will provide Phil uh, and me a, uh, an anonymous amount that Phil has generously uh, said that uh, he will contribute a significant, uh, what I consider, and I think most of us would consider a very significant amount as a match if um, uh, we do get contributions. So you have till May the 31st um, uh, to make a donation. It will be uh, consolidated in a, uh, a, a total package that will be presented to Phil. Um, and uh, Phil will then match it, uh, it uh, dependent on how generous we are, but it, he will make a generous match. Mm -hmm. And um, anyway, so I wanted to follow up with that to say, if you did contribute, it will be counted. Unfortunately, I contributed in December, so mine won't be counted, but uh, of course mm -hmm. I will do my best to uh, change my schedule and make another contribution to take advantage of the match. So, Please do your uh, think about it, and if you are able to do that, make your uh, your uh, uh, donation on the uh, foundation webpage. And um, thank you again for the generous matching um, uh, donation from Phil. So hopefully, I'll have good things to report back um, in June sometime. Uh, but they're thrilled. I have to say, the foundation is very thrilled to have this uh, come forward uh, to help with their uh, fundraising. So thank you. Hey, thank you, Liz. That, that was good news. Okay, Priscilla, how about you? Anything else? Nothing else to add. Thank you. Okay, thanks. Um, Gary, anything? Nothing. Okay, Sujatha? Okay. No, I have nothing to add. Thank you. Thanks. Suzanne? Yeah, I wanted to report that every year in American libraries, you get a poster for Poetry Month. Mm -hmm. And the city of Fairfax's Chris Cohen is, the, she's one of their um, public information officers. And I always take my poster to her because she's very interested in poetry. And mm -hmm. I mentioned it to someone and it turns out the Patrick Henry Library during the month of April does their closing message. They read a poem over the loudspeaker. Oh. 
at closing, which inspired me to suggest that maybe Jessica, who likes to do contests, could have a contest for the most unique closing ceremonies in branches and see how creative branches could be. Just an idea and happy holidays, everyone. Thank you, Suzanne. Sue, how about you? Um, nothing to add. Okay, thank you. Uh, Brian. Uh, well, in Braddock District, of course, we're losing our Kings Park manager, but that's okay. She'll be doing other stuff. At Burke Center, we had a, a nice book sale in the middle of March. We chose this time not to take any books out of the warehouse we, because we had so many packed around the branch. We didn't think we'd do that well, but we made $10,300 in just four days. So, wow. so that was very good. And now we're collecting more, more and more donations. And I will say we have uh, a number of interesting closing ceremonies. There's one woman, I won't give her name, but she sings quite a bit. And uh, she uh, will sing stuff like Happy Trails to You and stuff like that when she does the closing. So it's rather fun to... Uh, to listen for that when she when she does it. So a contest might be of interest. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, let's see, Jane. How about Jane Miscavige? <laughs> I have nothing. <laughs> Thank That's you. a dramatic reading of your name. Wow. Mm -hmm. uh, Keith. Uh, the only thing I want to say is that I'm excited about the um, the construction beginning. Uh, soon on the uh, Kingstown Library. So looking forward to that. Uh, but that's that's all I have. Thank you. All right. Um, now, has anybody else thought of anything else that they want? Last chance. I oh, think, Liz. oh, everybody's got their hand up. Almost. I, I don't think, I think this occurred after our last meeting, but I did go to the Traveling While Black uh, virtual reality program. And I don't know whether, you know, others uh, participated in that, but the, the most value to me that I took away from it um, was the comment cards that were on the wall afterwards that people submitted. Uh, the program had where you, they had different types of comment cards that you could complete, like I learned X, you know, dot, dot, dot. Um, I'm going to be doing something different, you know, those kinds of things. And reading the, uh, the comments were just really so heartfelt and people did attend and walk away with a lot of good things from that program. And thank you so much again, Fairfax Libraries, for sponsoring that uh, wonderful program. Okay. Anybody else? Suzanne, do you want to say anything about the book sale? Exactly. I, I realized I'd forgotten to do yeah, that. Okay. The Fairfax friends <laughs> and the Virginia Room friends are having their first book sale in a couple of years next week on um, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. That's the 22nd through the 24th. And the Virginia Room book sale is up in the Virginia Room. The friends sale is downstairs. And they are also doing an early, I think you pay something like $50 to come in early on Thursday night and select your books. We're kind of expecting the book dealers who usually come to come early and do their book, or maybe it's during the day Thursday. Um, but if you're interested, email me and I'll send you the details. But it's a chance for you to come early and get first pick of the books. But we, have, we are getting a delivery from the warehouse on Monday. It, which is the plan. And so we'll see how it goes. But I think both of our groups have a lot of stuff that's come in since since last September when we opened to donations again. So if you need some more books at your house, come by <laughs> Fairfax. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Oh, uh, Phil, yeah, go ahead. Suzanne, I'm gonna be out of town then, but you know, I work with this lady who has a, a nonprofit insight. Uh, it, I can't think of the name right now, but if there were any way you could get me kids books or something like that, you know, several things for it, I'll be happy to make a donation twice, whatever they ask for. Them. So I'm just asking if you could have any time to do that, just get me okay. a basket or, you know, um, uh, we are not doing and I'll be happy to donate. For okay. It. Phil, we're not including children's books in our sale this year. Um, okay. We will have a separate children's sale at another date, but email me and I will share it with the friends group. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Okay, 
So I think we're ready for a motion to adjourn. I move that we adjourn. Okay, thank you, Phil. Do we have a second? Second. Second. Who's saying that? I can't tell. Suzanne. Oh, okay. Thank you. Twice. Uh, oh, or Su if Sujatha beat me to it, that's fine. No, no, I did not. I was saying Suzanne said it twice. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. And, uh, I'm looking around, trying to see who it is. And um, is there any discussion on the motion? On the <laughs> okay. Yeah, let's discuss All those in it. favor, please. Oh, raise your little hand yeah. up. Okay, the motion has passed. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone, very much. Sujatha so will be in touch.